about comics, we tend to think about scenes, images, panels, moments, or maybe on a larger scale, issues or texts. You might not think about the page. It's a literal formal constraint. We make books with, well, pages. And that means if you want to publish a comic the traditional way, you have to deal with them. It can contain several scenes or part of a scene. It can be a single image or have many images. So the page seems like an arbitrary measurement of a comic. Except, well, it might be one of the more fundamental structures of the comic form outside of the panel. I'm Andrea Gilroy, and this is Comics Crash Course. So there's actually a lot going on with the page, and today I'm going to look at two scholars' thoughts on the subject. So first up is Charles Hatfield. In his chapter, An Art of Tensions, in his excellent book, Alternative Comics. So Hatfield writes that comics are best defined as a response to a series of formal tensions. I like this definition better than some of the ones I went over way back when, because Hatfield doesn't worry about pinning down specific traits that always have to be there, but instead thinks about how the elements of comics work relationally. He names four tensions and uses this word on purpose. You see, tension indicates that in any given work, the sides of these relationships he'll discuss are, well, in tension, which is to say that it's not an either or thing, it's a both and. and. The push and pull between the opposite poles of these relationships creates a scaffolding in which comics can flourish. Much in the same way a large suspension bridge is held up by the tension between opposing mechanical forces. Anyway, the first tension is one we'll be talking about soon, a tension between codes, in other words, word and image. The second is about panels, what Hatfield calls the tension between the single image and the image in series. That is, each panel operates as its own piece of art, uh, its own image, but also as part of a larger series of images. We talked a little bit about how this affects our modes of perception and how we read comics in the last two episodes. Now, the third and fourth tensions apply to the page. So I'm actually going to talk about the fourth first uh, because it can apply to the page, but it also applies more broadly. So this relationship is what Hatfield calls a tension between the text as experience and the text as an object. In other words, this refers to the way we experience a text um, individually and personally, that we get lost in its world, we think about it in our own terms. Yeah! And the fact that all texts are, well, objects in the real world, and they're subject to factors like design, marketing, sales. One example I give when I'm teaching this essay is when you pick up a book with an award sticker on it, for example, like a, on a Pulitzer Prize, you might think your experience of the text, the stories, the characters, the world is totally your own. But I bet you go in with certain expectations because of that sticker. Likewise, design factors like paper quality, typeface, and the, even the physical size of the book or its packaging can also affect how you respond to a story. These are some of the broader aspects of the fourth tension. Now, earlier I mentioned the page turn, and that it's part of the objective experience of many, and probably most, comics. Now, you might feel really lost in a good story, but a talented comics creator is using pages as part of the storytelling experience. They're holding storytelling points to the end of pages, and forcing you to pause and flip at just the right moment. This is one of the moments in comics an artist can really surprise you. While you might know what's coming on a page, I talked about this sort of peripheral perception in the last video, you don't know what's on the next page unless you have x-ray vision. This kind of control is hard to replicate in other forms, in prose for example. Different typefaces, book sizes, margins can change when you turn a page, and it doesn't really matter in the same way. So that makes the page turn a unique action to comics that is partly necessitated by the physical reality of a comic, but also part of how you experience the story. But the relationship that Hatfield outlines that most explicitly addresses the page is his third tension, that between sequence and surface. This is the tension between the page as a unit of storytelling, what I just sort of talked about, a container for a sequence of moments that make up a scene, and the page is a blank canvas upon which an artist has created a visual design. Imagine you're really sucked into a comic story. You're probably up close, nose to the book, reading each panel, maybe each row. 
but you're not really stepping back and looking at the whole page. You know, maybe one quick glance once or twice. However, a page from that same comic hanging in an art gallery, well, you're going to approach it differently. You're going to appreciate the whole image, the way the panel shapes are arranged, and the shapes and colors inside the panels flow in and out of each other. Now, both of these are ways to look at a page. And depending on the artist and the work, some pages lean more one way or the other. But all comics pages rest on this tension between the sequence of the page and the surface of the page. It's often easiest to see when artists are purposely experimenting with the page as a surface, creating an elaborate design for the panels. These are fantastic, but they can sometimes take readers out of a sequential experience. It takes a really talented artist to do something quite baroque with the layout that doesn't entirely pull a reader out of the story. However, pulling readers out of the story might be exactly the purpose of these kinds of extravagantly designed pages. Forcing the reader to pause and look rather than speed reading might be the point. It needn't always be so bold. Take, for instance, the classic grid pattern. This layout is so common as to be taken for granted. And yet from a distance, it's quite pleasing and symmetrical, a classic design. A good artist can use the pattern and the images inside the gridded panels to create a sense of repetition or to create movement or use colors and shapes to create deeper compositions within the grid. If you're only reading for sequence and not pulling out to see the surface, you might miss some of those design elements and therefore miss part of the comic that's happening in front of you. Now, I said in the beginning I'd discuss two theorists, so I think now is a good time to bring in the second. French critic Benoit Peters. While Hatfield is about relationships, Peters is a little more interested in description and categorization. Now, while I tend to like relationship-based definitions better, descriptions can be really useful for making sense of what kind of work a page is doing. So in Peters' 1998 book, Case Planche Récit, Lire la bande dessinée, he categorizes page layout into four main modes. So he splits it two ways. First is narrative dominant, what Hatfield might associate with sequence or story. And the other is composition dominant, which is what Hatfield would associate with surface, composition layout. So Peters complicates this by adding another categorization to the table. So some layouts privilege the autonomy of narrative or composition. That is, one or the other of those is the driving force behind the page to the exclusion of the other. The other category privileges the interdependence of narrative and composition. That is, the creation of the page comes from the artist considering how narrative and composition can work together to make the page layout. So this will make a little more sense as I describe the four modes, although I promise there will be some mouthfuls. So an autonomous narrative dominant page is working in what Peters calls the conventional use mode, which is purely organizational. The panel frames are, well, just there to have something to put pictures in. It's a grid for grid's sake. You plug in the narrative. The narrative is the important part. The grid is just there to be a container for the story. Now, despite the grid being recognizable, what's actually more common, in fact, Peters claims it's the most common page layout mode in comics, is the interdependent narrative dominant page layout, the rhetorical use mode. So this might look like a grid, but because of the relationship between composition and narrative, the page is organized and panels are shaped according to the needs of the narrative. So for example, a panel is larger because it helps the story or the emotion. So then we have the autonomous compositional dominant page or the decorative use mode. In the conventional use mode, panels are simply containers for the story. But in the decorative use mode, the story is simply providing a subject matter to fill in the art of the layout. The artist creates a page with purposefully designed composition that is the primary concern. Story flow and narrative afterthoughts. The final category is the interdependent compositional dominant page or the productive use mode. Just as composition serves the narrative in the rhetorical use mode, in the productive use mode, narrative serves composition. So as Peters points out, one of the most frequent users of this type of mode was Windsor McKay whose dream-inspired Little Nemo and Slumberland had these often awkward layouts that didn't make the strip easier to read, but did add to the visuals and create a dreamlike quality that is still hard to beat over a century after the fact. 
Panels stretch across the page, and inside, the creatures elongate, or the characters appear in step-like layouts, and inside them, they tumble up and down. I'm feeling a little bewildered? It's okay. We did dig pretty deep into the theory, and this is just meant to be an introduction to these ideas. We also went a little long. I guess that's the power of the page. In the description below, you can check out links to Hatfield and Peters. And for now, I'll let you breathe and see you next time.